ideal gas law. So exciting. Okay, so we are going to be using the ideal gas law throughout this course. Um, and in all honesty, you should take it with you for the rest of time um, because it represents how gases could behave. You might have a gas, say, that's not ideal at all and it behaves in a completely different way, but that doesn't mean that you can't model it using PV equals NRT. Um, because when you're modeling a system, you aren't after exact reality because sometimes that's just impossible to grasp. Um, but you can use this to at least get some understanding of the system. This will all make more sense at the end of the term. Anyway, okay. A model to describe a system. So what is a model? Well, this is some sort of an equation to predict. So we want to predict the properties um, or explain the observation. And so Boyle, back in like 1600, figured out that, I'm already stepping on pieces of paper, um, figured out that pressure and volume were inversely proportional. And so he went and took a bunch of different volumes of gases and he measured the pressure of them. And it turns out, and for, this is for the same amount. Um, and so if he put in a, um, so this is the same amount of gas, he was able to collect it. He put it into um, a glass vessel and then he measured the pressure associated with that. And he found that there was one data point at this pressure and that volume, he had that. And then at this volume and this pressure he had, or sorry, at this volume, uh, he had this pressure, okay? And then say at this volume, he had this pressure. And so it looked like it followed that kind of trend, inverse relationship. Like that's great. And so he knew that pressure was inversely proportional to volume. Yay. So he came up with an equation to predict what would happen. Now, granted, this was his equation. It was all the same temperature. He didn't incorporate much else. I mean, it really wasn't that good of an equation because he didn't know what this wasn't an equal sign. It was a proportionality. So then, let's see. Um, ah, so model to describe a system. So the, to describe part, this is a way, whoop, is a way to predict how the variables will change, All right? So if you know that the variables will change, so let's say if we change P in some way, then how does volume change? So Charles and a guy named Gay Lussac came up with uh, his volumes, oh, nope, temperature on them. So keeping the temperature or changing the temperature consistently, they were to see, okay, well, if the temperature's here, there's the volume. If the temperature's here, there's the volume. If the temperature's here, duh. And so they found this relationship. Turns out it was linear. Yay. Um, so this is known as Charles' law. This one's known as Boyle's law. And it keeps going. So Avogadro figured out, can you still see that? Yeah. Figured out that volume with the number of moles changes like so. And then who else? Gay Lussac. And there's a couple of other people involved with these. Um, so this would have been pressure and temperature. Pressure and temperature are kind of the same. You'll see, well, you see why here. And so they figured out that as volume or as the number of moles um, or the quantity of the gas changed, the volume changed. As the temperature increased, the pressure increased. As the temperature increased, the volume increased. And so you've got all of these, which this is really fun to do. I took a balloon outside the other day. Poor Jade, she's her little balloon and it just like shrinks down. Um, and she's like, oh, my balloon. <laughs> it's sorry, I'm mean to the kid. Anyway, so, um, so you've got a description of a system and a system has volume, pressure, temperature, number of moles. And then granted at this time, this is like 1600s, 1700s. Uh, late 1700s, all the way around to like 1860, I think. A guy named Clapeyron, or Clapeyron, um, French guy, Benoit Camille, I think. Clapeyron, I don't remember his middle name. Benoit is his first name. Um, he was like, oh my gosh, I bet all of these things are connected. And he said, okay, so P is proportional to some sort of constant. Then he had N, oh, whoops, NT over V. Oh. 
Let me rewrite that so you can see it. So we had P proportional to some constant times NT over V. And this constant, lo and behold, became R or the gas constant. Cool. Okay. So we have a model, an equation to predict things um, or to uh, 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 explain observation to describe. And so we describe it via pressures, volumes, temperatures, number of moles, a system. Well, our system in this case is going to be a gas. The simplest system that we can model, um, which is why we love gases. Cool. Okay. So PV equals NRT. This is our model. Yay. And we are going to use this to understand the laws of thermodynamics. And when I say that is the laws of thermo have all these rules associated with them. And you might be familiar with the rules of like, say, gravity. Here's a calculator. Here's gravity. Right? So there are rules associated with the laws of gravity. Well, there are rules associated with the laws of thermodynamics. If you put your system, say a gas, into a thermodynamics machine, it's going to follow these certain rules. And so what we can do it is represent those rules mathematically. Well, how do we know how things are changing? We're going to take the ideal gas law, we're going to stick it into this basically thermodynamics machine, and we're going to see and process how that model changes. Cool. OK. Um, I'm going to pause and erase back PV equals NRT. Cool thing. You can do the majority of PCAM, in particular in this class, by just doing a unit analysis. I kid you not. By the way, hashtag units. If you don't use units, I'm just going to fail you outright. Just you, you are, you, you must use units. Um, you have to, you just, you have to, um, just like you have to breathe, ah, <sighs> breathe. You have to use units. Okay, let me show you why. This is amazing. So you can do a, the majority of physical chemistry with a unit analysis. Let's explore. Pressure. What is a pressure? Think about it. What is pressure? How, if I had to find a unit, and don't just tell me ATM, atmospheres, well, what does that mean physically? Okay, so we have a force. So pressure, you're putting, you know, pressure on something. So it's a force. Per unit area. So there's there's this pressure or there's this pressure. Which one has more pressure? I'm, I'm pushing the same way, but one of them is going to hurt a lot more than the other. So you can see the indentation on my hand. Um, so we have a force per unit area. Okay. Area gets small. A is tiny. F over A. Small A equals big pressure. Same force over very large A, little pressure. This is how walking on the bed of nails thing works or laying on the bed of nails. Um, so you wanna make sure that one, you understand magnitudes, um, but also you've got force per unit. Break these things down into something that makes physical sense. Okay, all right. So we got force per unit area. Well, let's take that actually one step further. So force, divided by length times length, okay? How do you get an area? Well, x times y. That gives you the area of the, the square, okay? Next, volume. What is a volume? Length times width times some sort of depth, okay? So length times length times a length. So let's say length. Actually, I'm going to now take this down here. Cubed. Cool. Okay. So if I do that, length cubed, whoops, that takes out two of my lengths and I'm left with one length. Let's we'll get rid of that. Does everyone follow what I just did? So now I've got a force times just a length because my length times length times length canceled out with two of my lengths that are in the denominator. So that means I have a force times a length, also known as a force times a distance
any ideas what that equal well, pause on that. I told you that we can do all of PCHEM with just a unit analysis. So let's just do a unit analysis on this side and see what this is going to equal. Because we know it has to equal because there's an equal sign. Equal signs are your best friend. OK, so to this side, we've got moles, which is just a counting number. You just, how many moles? Two. Cool. OK, R. I would like to use the, there are many R's we're going to use, we're going to use all of them. Um, but for this one, I'd like to use joules per mole Kelvin. Because life is easy. Okay, so joules per mole Kelvin, that would be, uh, for that one, it would be 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. You'll have these memorized shortly, I promise. Okay, and then for temperature, I've got Kelvin. No, Fahrenheit's not allowed. You could use Celsius if you want to. Kelvin's the way to go. Okay, so let's cancel out our units. Moles cancel, and we're left with joules. What does a joule represent? Energy. Okay. Go team. Force times a distance is going to equal joules. Well, and if you think about it, this is like a Newton meter equals a joule. This is when physics is important. And so what kind of energy is this? Do y'all know? Give you a second to think. Starts with a war, ends with a k. Work energy. Whoa. Go team. Okay, so when you have pressure times volume, that's giving you a work energy. And this J value is associated, or this uh, uh, energy is associated with the work of the force across that distance when you've got the pressure across that volume. Okay, so then if we go then to the right hand side, this means that we've got a temperature associated, so joules per Kelvin. For every Kelvin, we have a certain number of joules. Well, how many Kelvins do we have? Well, the temperature tells us how many Kelvins that we've got. So this tells us the energy from the temperature or the heat. And I'm going to say related to heat. So it's related to heat. It's not heat. Heat's different. We're going to get there next chapter. So, okay, so we've got PV work is equal to NRT, thermal or heat, energy. Cool? Okay. Um, pause there for us. Actually, I think that's all I want to talk about with ideal gas law.